Good afternoon. My name is Amy Roan and I'm the State Director for the Nebraska Department of Education, Office of Special Education, and the Nebraska MTSS State Lead. As the state of Nebraska and every state in our nation have experienced many disruptions in their normal way of doing business, the NEMTSS team made the difficult decision to cancel our in-person 2020 summit. However, our team is so very excited to bring to you our six-week summit series virtually. Similar to our five-week summer series, the virtual series Moving Forward Into the Unknown begins today featuring sessions to help schools promote success and wellness for students and staff. Our weeks will have focuses within equitable opportunities for all, engaging and strengthening partnerships, adults as change agents, creating a climate of support, putting the pieces together and moving forward. The virtual summit will bring messages from national experts around social emotional learning and is intended for all educators. We will have specific tracks that are focused on administration or school leaders, instruction, and early childhood. Many of the days have concurrent sessions that will bring specific support information to sessions in the different tracks to those of you who may be looking for support in those different areas. We've delineated that within the registration, so please make sure and check that out. We are excited to bring these amazing presenters and their messages to Nebraska schools and educators and hope that you will join us for the remainder of the five sessions after today, or five weeks after this week. We are excited as we are about to embark on our journey. So I'm going to get this virtual summit started with our first presenter, and I'm gonna have Christy Fedden from our Nebraska MTSS team introduce her to you. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon, everyone. We're really excited for those of you who are able to join us live, and for those who will be watching virtually in the future, we welcome you as well. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Celeste Malone is joining us. And she is an associate professor and coordinator of the school psychology program at Howard University. So I wanna give you a little bit of, of Dr. Malone's background to set the stage for our time together this afternoon. She received her PhD in school psychology from Temple University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in child clinical and pediatric psychology at the John Hops Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. But prior to obtaining her doctorate, Dr. Malone received her master's in school counseling from Johns Hopkins University. Her primary research interest relates to multicultural and diversity issues embedded in the training and practice of school psychology. Specifically, Dr. Malone focuses on multicultural competence, the ability to work effectively with diverse populations through the application of cultural knowledge and to demonstrate awareness and sensitivity to cultural issues. Her research centers on the development of multicultural competence through education and training, diversification of the profession, and the relationship between culturally competent practice and PK-12 student outcomes, which is ultimately a very strong focus of our work with Nebraska MTSS. Related to her interest in professional issues in school psychology, Dr. Malone has continuously held leadership positions in psychology professional associations. She currently serves as the National Association of School Psychologists Board of Directors as a strategic liaison for the social justice strategic goal. In that capacity, Dr. Malone works closely with NAS boards and committees to develop and implement programs and activities to address social justice issues in school psychology and education. Additionally, Dr. Malone is an elected member of the American Psychological Association Board of Educational Affairs, the governance group which develops policies for education and training in psychology. We are grateful, Dr. Malone, for your time this afternoon and for your presence and for all that we will stand to learn from you as you share your knowledge with us. And I will let everyone know there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, but until that time, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Malone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that warm welcome and thank you so much for inviting me. I just wish that I was able to attend in person to experience the stay and see everyone in real life. But in the meantime, these virtual formats will have to do. 
And so today, my talk will be addressing multi-level interventions to address disproportionality. And these are our learning objectives. And so first, to describe a multidimensional view of bias and the conceptual model of disproportionality, to identify strategies to address implicit bias at both the individual and systems level, and finally, to describe school-wide interventions to address disproportionality with a focus on school discipline. So in your chat box, because um, I want to learn a little bit more about the issues that you're dealing with. And so as I mentioned, a lot of this talk will focus on looking at discipline disproportionality. However, the techniques and the policies and practices that we'll be discussing are also applicable and relevant to other areas of disproportionality as well as and other equity issues. And so to help me get a better sense of the room, if you could put in the chat box, what is the most significant equity issue at your school or within your LEA? Okay, inequality in rural areas, equity and disciplinary actions. SPED versus non-SPED, socioeconomic diversity. That's a, socioeconomic diversity is an area, an aspect of diversity that is very much underappreciated and looking at differences within groups, socioeconomic. Okay. Great. I'll give it a couple more seconds in case there are other ones that people would like to drop into the chat. Disciplining students of color, high quality instruction for all students. Okay. Lacking diversity, working with gifted students. Lack of equity with regards to gifted programming. And so a number of equity issues that were raised, it appears that equity with regards to socioeconomic status seems to be the most prevalent concern from the attendees here. And so when I talk about issues around disproportionality, I'll talk about the use of data. Uh, most disproportionality research does look at race ethnicity and those gaps there. However, in this country, we can't race and socioeconomic status are so closely intertwined. And so as I talk about how we use and look at data and discussing issues around disproportionality, we'll make sure to also include a lens of looking at, the, at issues with regards to socioeconomic status and equity. And so to start us off, I wanted to highlight this particular tool. And so this was a tool that was developed by ProPublica, which is an independent news outlet. And it's a tool that they created to look if there is issues of racial inequality or inequity within your state, your district, or your school. And this database was created through publicly available data from the U.S. Department of Education, including the Civil Rights Data Collection, Common Core of Data, Education, Demographic, and Geographic Estimates. And when you look up any respective school district or an individual school, you're able to look at four different indicators. So the first is looking at educational opportunity. It also looks at discipline as well as segregation. So is when there is racial ethnic diversity within your district, how, what does it look like on the actual school level? And then looking at the achievement gap between different racial groups. So a very, very cool tool. And I'm gonna highlight some data specific to Nebraska, though I encourage you to go on the website and look up the data for your respective school district, as well as any individual schools. And so when we look at the overall Nebraska data, it indicates that about a third of the students in the state are non-white, a little less than half are eligible for free or reduced lunch. The state has a very high graduation rate of 89%. 
However, we do see opportunity and discipline gaps. And so with regards to opportunity, it looks at access to to be able to participate in advanced placement courses. And so within the state of Nebraska, white students are one and a half times more likely to be in an advanced placement class compared to black students. The discipline index looks at out of school, the rate of out of school suspensions between groups. And within the state, black students are over five times more likely to be suspended when compared to white students. And so when we look at some of these initial metrics with regards to opportunity and discipline, it does highlight that there are some inequalities and inequities that exist within the state. And this is what it looks like with regards to discipline. And so looking at the racial ethnic diversity that is present within the school population of Nebraska, as I mentioned before, 33% non-white, 67% white. And that's this top bar here. However, when you look at the out of school suspension composition, as well as the expulsion composition, you'll notice that black and Hispanic students are overrepresented in both of those groups. And that's consistent with the information that I shared on the previous slide, indicating that black students were at a higher risk of getting suspended when compared to their white counterparts. But then when you look at the demographic side by side, the, having this visual really helps you understand understand how clear and stark these differences are. I went on the Nebraska Department of Education site, as I do for most of the presentations I prepare for, I try to get as much local data and information as possible, because I wanted to get into a deeper dive and really highlighting the importance of looking at different metrics, so not just discipline, but getting more information with regards to educational opportunities but then being able to look at discipline and opportunity data, not just from a racial and ethnic lens, but for students who are at risk, students who are homeless, students who are LGBT. And so I couldn't find that information readily available on the state site, but I would encourage you to look at these data for your own local context so you could get a better sense of understanding what these disparities are and the magnitude of these disparities so that you can move forward and actually do something about them. And so when we think about issues of inequity, discipline is one that is often highlighted. And it is not that Black or Hispanic Latinx students are worse than white students or are more likely to get into dis, uh, to have disciplinary problems. However, it speaks more to well, what are the decisions that are being made with regards to disciplining students. And when we think about the consequences of if you have two students, a white student and a black student, and they engage in the same type of offense, the black student is more likely to be punished in a harsher manner. And that taps into um, and that taps into some of the issues with regards to implicit bias and inequity, which I'll get into in just a second. I forgot I had this other slide here because I also wanted to look at some of the school districts and get a closer look at for the other indicators. And so when you look at the state level, you only have access to opportunity and discipline. But when you look at the school district or individual school level, you also have the segregation index as well as the achievement gap. And so the Looking at the two largest school districts that are in the state, the opportunity gaps and discipline gaps closely mirror what we see on the broader state level. Um, very different, these districts are very different with regards to demographics with Omaha public schools having a much higher percentage of non-white students than Lincoln schools do. But nonetheless, you see a lot of similarities with regards to the opportunity gap for black students as well as the discipline gap for black students. This also highlights that within the respective school district that there is some segregation between black and white students, meaning that they're not likely to be at the same school or the distribution is not even across the district itself. And then we also see the achievement gap. And so that black students are this many grades behind white students academically. And again, it's pretty close. And so while the demographics of the district are different, particularly with regards to racial and ethnic diversity, nonetheless, we still see those opportunity and discipline gaps persisting. <laughs> 
And so I was mentioning earlier, a lot of that is very much tied to bias and how discriminatory behavior is embedded within our school-based practices. And so when we consider bias, we have to look at it twofold. Explicit bias is the bias that you are very aware, conscious of, it's very deliberate, that I don't like such and such group that you're able to say it outright, it occurs on a very conscious level. But explicit bias is not the only type of bias that guides our decision making and our behavior. We also have to consider the role of implicit bias. And so implicit bias, that's our unconscious behavior, our unconscious beliefs that we hold about a particular group. To be clear, we all have bias. And these biases are formed based on our actual interactions with different groups. They're also shaped by messages that we receive from our families of origin. When we think about the media, when we think about our own personal experiences or hearing about the experiences of others, that we form notions or beliefs about particular groups and they shape our behavior on a very unconscious level, meaning that we hold these beliefs, but we're not necessarily pulling them up or being able to actually state what those beliefs are. And so when we look at instances of discriminatory behavior, we have to consider our explicit beliefs, but then also really understanding the messages that we've received about certain groups over time. And again, we all hold these biases, but we have to be deliberate and mindful about what are the messages that we've received about certain groups and being aware about how they may guide our decision making and our actual behavior. And so taking a closer look at implicit bias and tying it in more specifically to discipline, implicit bias, we see that in act and discipline policies in a number of ways. And so first, looking at the frequency of discipline of referrals. So students from racial and ethnic minoritized groups are much more likely to be disciplined for subjective behavior interactions. So someone being called out that you were being disrespectful or you were being defiant or disruptive in some way. And so while those categories may appear objective at the surface that like, oh, well, it's pretty clear if someone is being disruptive or if not, it requires a judgment call by the teacher, administrator, or whatever individual. And so they may not be in, a, in the greatest of moods that day and so may have a lower tolerance for particular behavior. And so there is a level of subjectivity about, well, what does it mean to be disruptive? What does it mean to be disrespectful or defiant? Because different teachers and educators in the building can have very different beliefs about what they mean. And because of that ambiguity, we often see much more um, distinctions or disproportionality with regards to discipline referrals for these subjective disciplines because they don't have the subjective criteria. We also see implicit bias in acting and how we appraise students' behavior. And so in a few studies, it's shown that for pre-service, for white pre-service teachers, they're more likely to interpret the facial expressions of black individuals as angry, it's as well as perceiving black boys being more hostile. And so again, you could have two students who are engaging in that same behavior, one black and one white. But if the black student is perceived as appearing more angry or appearing more hostile, the teacher may judge that behavior more severely and as a result engage or provide a more severe disciplinary sanction. And then finally, we're looking at the severity of discipline, which I touched upon earlier. And compared to white students, black students are more likely to be labeled as troublemakers. And we see this implicit bias within disciplinary decisions emerge, not just with educators or teachers rather, but then also in administrators, because ultimately they're the ones who are making decisions about whether a student stays in school or if they're gonna be removed from the classroom. And so we've found that race predicts harsher discipline after the second infraction, more days of detention, as well as an increased likelihood of future suspension. And so when we think about these disciplinary gaps, when we think about those opportunity and achievement gaps that I highlighted before, we have to think about the relationship among all three. And so if we have groups of students that are being disciplined more severely and are more likely to receive out of school suspensions, that means that they're having more time outside of the classroom. And that's more time where they're not getting access to instruction 
and it leads to this very slippery and dangerous pathway that we often call the school to prison pipeline. Because these students are being removed from educational opportunities, they end up falling further and further and further behind, as you saw evidenced by the achievement gap. That could also lead to overall low motivation, less connectedness to the school environment, and then eventual dropout. And so we do have to think about not just addressing these disciplinary disproportionality in and of itself, but really thinking about the downstream consequences caused by this discipline disproportionality. And so when we think about bias, there are some conditions that encourage more biased responding. And so again, I'll reiterate the fact that we all hold biases and these biases are mental shortcuts. They allow us to respond quickly. However, it may cause us to have actions or more negative actions against some groups. And so some of the conditions that encourage biased responding this quick, fast decision-making are time constraints. And so think about when a teacher is in the classroom, you hear some type of noise or some type of disruption and you turn around and you seek to respond, you're doing so quickly and you have to make a dis you feel like you have to make a decision right away. And so in those time constrained moments, you're more likely to respond in a biased manner and your implicit biases are more likely to emerge. We also see this in ambiguous situations where there's these shades of gray or things aren't clear and that I can't decide what it is that I need to do. It's not clear what the situation is. That's when we're more likely to respond in a biased manner. And so, as I mentioned before, that some of the biases around students of color are, are based on them appearing harsher or more angry or their behaviors being judged more severely. And in the absence of some clear guidance or rules, as a result, when we respond in a biased manner, they'll likely have more severe consequences. And so think about what I said before, that subjective discipline referrals, that's where we see the most disproportionality. We don't really see it as much in those objective cases. But also when we are cognitive busy, when we're dealing with a lot of stimuli at once, when we have just a lot on our minds, we get into this mental overload. And so instead of being able to take a step back and think through, well, what exactly happened in a very serialized and stepwise manner, our brains can't handle it. And so we rely on the biases or impressions or thoughts we have about particular groups to help guide our decision making. And then finally, when you're not paying attention to a task, when you're dividing your attention in some way, that's also when we're likely to respond in a more biased manner. And so when we look at these four conditions, time constraints, ambiguity, that cognitive overload and lack of attention, this often describes situations that teachers are encountering every day in the classroom, that they have to make decisions quickly about what to do with one student because there's several other students that they need to attend to. That when we look at how our disciplinary infractions are described in school policies or manuals, such as looking at defiance or disrespect, there are not clear definitions there. And so it's often a judgment call about what the teacher needs to do. Teachers are often responding to multiple things at once and that contributes to the cognitive overload and busyness and the lack of attention. And so all of those conditions occurring in one setting often leads to these issues of disproportionality that we see with regards to our discipline decisions as well as other decisions that occur within school settings. And so when we think about bias, we often think of this one-to-one -one correspondence that someone holds implicit bias about a particular group and it immediately leads to some disproportionate discipline. However, it's much more nuanced than that. And so when we think about the biases that we all hold and that connection to disproportionate discipline, there is some type of decision state that we're making a choice. Should I send the student out of the office or not? Do I call the principal or call the school resource officer or not? Can I handle this in my classroom? And so we're engaging in multiple decisions that will mediate the role of our bias in acting. And so again, it's not that someone holds a bias and then it comes out within disproportionate discipline 
or inappropriate special education referrals or a lack of referrals to gifted programming, that there's a choice that someone is making during that time. And we call these choices or decision situations vulnerable decision points. And again, they're more likely to occur when there is some type of subjective behavior, when we have a vague discipline system and that behavior infractions are not well defined or operationally defined. We think about the settings in which these disciplinary infractions incur. So if it's in the classroom, a teacher may have a stronger relationship with the student as opposed to something happening in the hallway when it's a student that they don't know. We also think about the decision state of the particular teacher or the adult and that when we are hungry, when we're hungry or fatigued, we just have less cognitive and mental resources at play to guide our decision making. And so we're making decisions fast and in a hurry. And that's when bias is more likely to take hold. And so when we look at this broader model, this conceptual model of disproportionality, we're looking at a number of predictors, moderators, as well as the outcomes, that we're just not taking it as is, that there's bias that exists, and this will enact in our disciplinary systems, but we're looking at it in a much broader sense. And so we're considering some of these less malleable factors, such as explicit bias, which I mentioned at the very beginning, the structural variables that occur within our schools, because we can't change our school composition, it is what it is. And so we can't do it. We can't do much about the structure of the school, the demographics, or we may have limited control over resources available. And then with regards to implicit bias, it is malleable to an extent, but it is it can be challenging to change. And so we have these different predictors that we know the role of bias and its relationship to school discipline. We also know that in looking at school demographics, when we have schools that have higher percentages of students of color or students who are experiencing economic marginalization, we often see higher use of disproport of exclusionary discipline practices. But we can intervene in different ways. And so while we may not be able to change much over here, we can change our policies and our practices and taking a closer look. And so with regards to our policies, thinking about regular collection and reporting of discipline data disaggregated by race, as well as other cultural identity factors that are of interest. So socioeconomic status came up quite frequently in chat. We could look at the students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch and to see if there's any disproportionality there with regards to school discipline or with educational outcomes. And then we also encourage you to look at the intersections of different identities as well. We could also look at our school and district policies to make sure that they support equity and have some lens of accountability to them that there is someone higher up that's monitoring th these data and are providing feedback to schools and telling them that they need to do something differently when it's evidence of disproportionality. We also have to think about our school practices. What are the things that we're actually doing within our school setting? And so that's an identifying our school specific vulnerable decision points. We wanna make sure that our disciplinary guidelines are as clear as possible so that there isn't that same room for subjectivity as well as teaching neutralizing routines when you're at a vulnerable decision point. And so when we're able to, when we're changing our policies and our practices, those are more malleable and they'll have an impact and um, mitigate the impact that bias and structural variables have on disproportionality. And so when we keep students in schools, when we're reducing the rate of suspension and office disciplinary referrals, that often leads to increased student achievement because students are actually in the classroom being able to learn. And it also decreases the rates of dropout because again, kids are in the classroom able to learn. They're also developing relationships with teachers and other adults in the school building and not feeling like the school or individuals are out to get them. And so when we think about reducing disproportionality, it's clear that we have to address it in a multitude of 
employees. And I'm going to go through these different strategies here. And so first, we want to prevent the situations that lead to the use of disproportionate discipline or exclusionary discipline. And that's looking at our academic instruction as well as school-wide positive behaviors, interventions, and supports. We also want to reduce the effects of explicit bias. And so thinking about the data and information that we collect and disaggregating it by race as well as other variables of interest and taking a closer look at our policies to ensure that they support equity and accountability. And then finally, we want to reduce the effects of implicit bias by identifying our school specific vulnerable decision points, reducing ambiguity in our discipline procedures, and teaching adults in the school neutralizing routines to use for these vulnerable decision points. So first, looking at preventing situations that could lead to disproportionate discipline. And as I, and I believe that the audience is mostly school psychologists, but then also thinking about educators and other school based professionals, it may seem odd to be talking about instruction when I've really been focusing on discipline. But it's important to know that academic engagement is incompatible with disruptive behavior. And so again, if we're thinking about the disciplinary categories that lead to the most disproportionality it is disrespect, defiance, and some type of disruption. And so if a student is actually engaged in the learning task, that means that they're attentive to what's happening in the classroom, they're listening to the teacher, they're working with peers, and they are not being disruptive in any sense. And so we really do need to think about how do we develop more engaging instruction to increase equity with regards to learning outcomes, as well as being able to change our disciplinary outcomes. And so some instructional strategies that are listed here, as well as guiding questions to go through. And so first, the use of explicit instruction. We often ask or expect students to do tasks, but we never actually taught them how to do it, that our instructions or directions weren't clear. And so it's really important to be explicit in our instructions to teaching students what it is that they need to do. We also need to build in prime background knowledge, and we could build in the tenets of culturally responsive teaching as we do so. And so making sure that you have a basic understanding of your student's culture and think about how that may impact the background knowledge that they're bringing into a particular subject area. Also thinking about how do we make these concepts more relevant to students' everyday lives so that they do feel more engaged in the academic instruction. We also want to ensure that students have the opportunity to respond and so that teachers and educators are not talking at students and are pouring into them without having the opportunity for students to ask clarifying questions or to demonstrate their knowledge. And then providing performance feedback as well that we want if students are doing something incorrectly we want to know and provide them feedback so they're not getting mass practice on an incorrect skill or an incorrect routine. And so as well as providing specific praise contingent on the display of appropriate behaviors in the classroom. I mentioned briefly in the previous slide about the role of culturally responsive teaching. And so when we look at the tenets of culturally responsive teaching, it's not so much changing the content that we are presenting, but it's how do we make this content more salient to students' cultural identities and thinking about the background information and knowledge that they're bringing about a subject and how can we better connect those two. And so that requires us to have a better understanding of our, studi our students' experiences, their cultural backgrounds, and I mean cultural in the broadest sense, not just specific to race and ethnicity, to see how we can make those connections between what students already know and what we're trying to teach them in the classroom. And so when we look at these three tenets, it shapes the overall approach that we use to deliver instruction. And so using a variety of modalities, so not just individual learning, but then also group learning. We're thinking about our curricular materials to ensure that our students are actually reflected in the content that we're being taught. When we think about making educational decisions, we're bringing our students and their families into the conversation as well. And so when we look at culturally responsive and sustaining teaching, we're definitely focusing on the approach and not working under the assumption that the teacher is a keeper of all knowledge, but we're really working to co-construct knowledge with our students to help develop their engagement. And again, when students are engaged, that's incompatible with disruptive behavior.
we also think about the lens through which we see our students and our students learning. And so not taking a deficit based approach, which we often see in school settings, but looking at a more strength based approach instead. So not is it, oh, the student can't do this, but this is where the student is starting from and we're looking to build their capacity. And then finally, looking at that filter. So how do we listen and take in information from students to really think about, well, what is the message that they're sending us what, through their behavior, not just through their words, but then also through their actions. That behavior serves a purpose and a function. And so but taking a strength-based approach, when a student engages in misbehavior, we're not looking at it that the student is being bad, but we're thinking about, well, what is the message? Are they, do they need additional attention or support from me as an instructor in the classroom? Is there some disconnect between the content that is being taught and their actual knowledge and skill base? And so when we think about that filter, we're really looking through our students and assuming the best, as opposed to assuming that they're seeking to be disruptive or that they're not actually trying to engage and connect with the content. The other part I mentioned was looking at school-wide positive behaviors, interventions, and supports. And that ties back into what I said before about explicit instruction, because for school-wide PBIS, we're defining and teaching positive school-wide behavior expectations to all students. The adults in the building are acknowledging and rewarding appropriate student behavior. And so it's not just looking at these external reinforcers, but also the use of praise and developing positive relationships with students. And throughout this process, we are collecting and using discipline data to guide our efforts um, because we can't address areas of disproportionality that we're not aware of. And so by collecting data on a regular basis and analyzing those data on a regular basis, we get a better sense of which students have more intense needs. And so when we think about school-wide PBIS for school discipline, it's a proactive instructional approach because again, we are teaching these behavioral expectations to students. Students and communities should also have a role in developing what these, school, what these roles and expectations are. And so as we're able to work together to develop the rules and expectations for our school building, that does increase buy-in and Again, we're teaching kids the behavior that we want them to see, which decreases the likelihood of inappropriate behavior. It's also changing the type of messages and the interactions that adults have with students within the schools and really focusing on building positive relationships that the adults in the building are really focused on catching kids being good as opposed to waiting for them to mess up or to fail. And it could often feel like that for students of minoritized backgrounds because they're often very well aware of issues of disproportionality. They may not know the word disproportionality or be able to see the exact data, but they definitely get a sense of which, which teachers are being perceived as fair or not, which, stu which teachers will actually listen to them or hear their side of the stories and which teachers will automatically send them out of the classroom. And so when we use tenets of school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports, we're focusing on that relationship building and students get the sense that the adults in the building want them to succeed and they're just not waiting for them to mess up. Within PBIS, there's also more objectivity in that we're providing operational definitions of appropriate behavior, but then also describing what inappropriate behavior looks like. And so when we're able to have more objective referral and discipline procedures, it eliminates or decreases the risk of biased responding and decision making when it comes to issues of school discipline. And then finally, professional development is embedded within PBIS, and so it can provide teachers with more instructional responses, and so other tools and strategies that they could use to address behavior infractions within the classroom setting, as opposed to sending students out. PBIS has been criticized, um, because, especially when it's not done in a culturally responsive lens, because it's seen as a way of indoctrinating students, 
or erasing students' identities and really focusing on a, having a specific type of behavior without any type of variations or recognizing the different cultures that exist within the school. And the response to that is that when we develop or a school or district is developing their school rules, the importance of getting community buy-in and recognizing that the school is nested within the broader context of community and you can't divorce the two. And so as schools are looking to develop their systems, they should be in including and soliciting the voices of families, students, and in the community by surveys, by focus groups, things of that nature, and working with the student population to describe what these rules look like within the school setting, but then also honing that it could look different at home. It could look different in the neighborhood because there's some behaviors that may not be appropriate for the school setting, but they could be very much adaptive depending on where the student is in their household or where the student is situated in their neighborhood. And so we want to be careful about sending the messages versus good or bad behavior, but it's really behavior that is appropriate for a given context as well. When we look at reducing the effects of explicit bias, we need to think about our school policies. And when we think about education in this country writ large, that the educator workforce is predominantly white and female. The student pre-K through 12 population in this country is not. They are increasingly much more racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse. But as I mentioned before, individuals all hold bias. And if we are not aware and examining our bias, and we are in a position of power and authority within schools, we could institutionalize the biases that we hold in our school policies and our practices. And so when we look at our school-based policies, we have to consider well, is there a lens of bias that is shaping what it is that we're doing? And some school policies that are particularly vulnerable to bias are shown here. And so looking at discipline referrals, what type of infractions will get an out-of-school suspension versus an in-school suspension versus a phone call to the parent? When we think about dress codes, they have very much a clear link to discipline in that a lot of schools, in a lot of school settings, students may be getting suspended for dress code infractions, but we need to take a closer look at the dress codes themselves. And so for a lot of dress codes, they are, have a bias against those who identify as female. They often have a bias against those who identify as members of racial and ethnic minoritized groups. And so when we look at our school policies and our dress codes, we have to think, is this necessary or is this the desired behavior? And if it's something that's desired, where does this come from? What does it actually have an impact on learning and what occurs in the school? And if it doesn't, it may suggest that that's somewhat of a biased policy. When we think about special education referrals, again, we have to think about how do we go through those exclusionary criteria and think of well, what is appropriate behavior? Why am I referring this student versus another student? What is it actually based on? And so looking at our policies and practices with special ed referrals, the use of pre-referral interventions, do we give students the opportunity to be successful before removing them into special education, that they have access to all opportunities to actually learn before we're considering labeling them with a disability? access to honors and advanced placement courses. And as you saw on one of the earlier slides, there is an opportunity gap within the state and then within respective school districts that students just may not have the opportunity to take these higher level courses. And it may be an artifact of school funding and resources. So how resources are actually distributed within a school district. So school A may have the resources to have an AP biology lab, but school B within the same district is underfunded and can't support a lab. And so as a result, their students don't have access to advanced placement science courses. We also have to think about the ways in which students get referred to these courses. So is it that the guide the school counselor or a teacher is making that referral or do students just have the option to sign up? Because we often see that if this is a process that's guided by a counselor, 
students, uh, particularly students of color, are tracked into lower courses. And so the adults in the building limit their opportunities and don't even allow them the chance to experience an AP course. And then finally, looking at our decisions with regards to suspension or expulsions. So what are the infractions that lead to a suspension or to an expulsion? What is the role of context and other information that we get that guides our decision making? And so when we look at the conditions that encourage bias within our policies, we think of that systemic pressure. And so schools are often responding to a number of outside forces that if you look within one school, they're reporting to the district, the district reports to the state, the state reports outcomes to the federal government. But then you also have the pressure from families and other community stakeholders. We need to do something about this right now. So thinking around issues of school violence, that's one where we need to do something about this. Schools have to be safe. And because of all this pressure, there are lots of policies put into place that harden schools without really considering, well, what are the unintended consequences of these policies? But schools feeling that they have to do something about school violence may succumb to having some policies that have bias in them. The lack of data. And so if we're doing something because it sounds good on the face, so it has strong face validity, but we don't have the data to support its effectiveness, that this is actually a good policy for us to use, or it has an equitable impact for all groups, lack of data that could lead to bias being embedded in our policies. Additionally, priming as well. And so the messages that we receive about certain groups and saying that we need to do something about them. Going to the example of dress codes, the heavy priming there is that girls are treated as sexual beings. Girls are highly sexual. We need to do something about and to cover them up so that they don't become a distraction to other students in the school. That's the effect of heavy priming that leads to dress code policies that may be biased against female identifying students. And then we also have to consider the, historic, the current and historical impact of institutional racism within our country. In looking at issues around school desegregation, school funding, housing, all of those are very closely related in thinking about what resources schools get and what resources schools don't get. And looking at that distribution of resources across a state, um, across a given district. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, looking at the two largest school districts within your state, both of them very different with regards to their racial ethnic diversity, but nonetheless, both of those districts are very much segregated. And so when we see that type of segregation within a school district, we also have to see where the money is going and is there a difference in terms of how schools are actually resourced. And so when we connect the dots with regards to the implicit bias embedded within school policies, we have that priming that I mentioned before that taps into our implicit biases, the biases that we're not aware of, as well as our explicit biases. For our implicit biases, that leads us to think about stereotypes around particular groups, as well as enacting in discriminatory behavior. Explicit bias, there's a much more direct impact between explicit bias and discriminatory behavior. But when we consider the stereotypes that we hold about particular groups, as well as our own discriminatory behavior, that's when it gets enacted with regards to policies. And so if I think or believe that Black students are more dangerous, then I am going to have a policy that may have a differential impact on Black students because I need to control them in some sort of way. Socioeconomic status came up frequently. And so if I believe that students from low economic or if students who are experiencing economic marginalization, that their families don't care about school as much or their parents aren't invested as much invested in schools. I may have some school policies that are very, that have strict definitions of family involvement, meaning that we only have these activities during the day, that we're not soliciting feedback from families with regards to our academic or our discipline policies because we have the we're under the stereotype or belief that these families don't care, and then it gets enacted within policies. And so we do have to build an awareness of the biases that we hold, as well as engage in regular system checks to make sure that these policies aren't, don't have bias embedded within them.
And we do that by looking at the impact. And so when a school district has a policy that may appear neutral on the surface, we have to go back to our data to see if it has an adverse impact for students of a particular race, color, national origin, economic status, linguistic status, gender, when compared to other students. Because again, it could look neutral on the surface, but unless we take that deeper dive in our data itself, we won't know or be able to identify any differential impact. We also have to ask ourselves, is that policy or practice necessary to meet an important educational goal? And so we have policies in place because we think that it will be effective or we think that it will create a safe learning environment when there's actually no evidence or limited evidence that it, actually, that it does so. So I'll reference back to dress code policies, which could be particularly harsh, especially to female identifying students. Are we seeing the desired impact as a result of that dress code policy? We're seeing increased academic achievement. If we're not, then we do have to question why do we have this policy in the first place, especially when we have a disparate impact. And then finally, we have to consider if there are alternative policies or practices that would meet our stated educational goal and that don't have that harsh or as much of a discriminatory effect. And so when we think about our policies, we have to do some level of backwards mapping. What is the impact that we wanna have and what is the policy that is going to get us there? And so when we put that policy in place, making sure that we are creating systems that are collecting data and assessing impact to make sure that the policy is one, doing what we actually want it to do, and two, making sure that it's not marginal, inadvertently marginalizing specific groups within our schools. And so some broader recommendations for examining school policies is looking at the application of discipline policies as related to your students. So who are the students that are getting out of school suspensions or expulsions in school suspensions? Is that proportionate to the, popu the demographics of your school? If it's not, then you may wanna question that policy itself or how it's actually enacted. We want to think, examine the implementation of a student code of conduct, as well as how students and parents are interpreting that code of conduct to make sure that we are both receiving the same message. We need to be aware of our intentionality and disparate impact, so being intentional in the practices that we want to promote the educational impact, but also making sure that some groups aren't being marginalized in the process. And then we also want to engage our parents, families, and communities to form these broader partnerships because bias is able to be enacted or embedded within our school, within our policies when we have a relatively homogenous group that's making the decisions and doesn't have anybody else from a different cultural background or experience that is questioning them. And so it's easy to get in that sense of group think that this is what works for us or this is what works for me, this is what will work for all. But we also need to have that space to invite critique and other viewpoints from those who are being impacted by those policies. And so it's important to have the voice of our parents, our families, as well as students. And then the last category is looking at reducing the effects of implicit bias. And so implicit bias is malleable to a degree, but you have to be motivated to control your bias. And so to have that level of control, you have to be aware of what your biases are. There are a number of different tools, such as Project Implicit. They have a number of implicit association tests, so not just a black-white one, but looking at gender, looking at sexuality and sexual orientation, um, ageism, looking at a number of different categories so that you as an individual can get a better sense of the biases that you hold. Because there's often a disconnect between what our stated beliefs are, but then those biases that we've internalized through messaging from families, from our friends, from our own personal experiences and the media. So we have to be aware of our biases, but we also have to be concerned about the consequences of our biases. And so for educators, having an awareness of how bias enacts in different school-based outcomes, such as disproportionate discipline, such as the achievement and the opportunity gaps. 
we need to be aware of the potential for bias. So when we have less cognitive capacity, when we are busy, when we need to make decisions quickly, those are moments when we're more likely to respond in a biased manner. But because you know that there are situations that are more prone to bias, being able to stop and take some time to engage in that slow thinking and slow processing to decrease the likelihood of responding in a biased way. And so by taking that time to consider individual characteristics, it helps to avoid stereotype evaluations. This slide briefly describes a multi-component intervention to reduce implicit bias. And so it's focused on five different tenets. And so the first is looking at stereotype replacement. And so recognizing when you're responding to a situation or a person in a stereotypical manner and actively substituting the biased response for an unbiased one. And so that does require, again, a level of awareness about your own implicit biases as well as the potential for bias. The second strategy is engaging in counter stereotypic thinking. So detecting your own stereotypical responses, but then also thinking about those counter narratives. Who are the individuals that prove that stereotype wrong to kind of snap you out of that way of thinking? Similarly, individuation, you're gathering more information about a person or a particular context, so that replaces any generic thoughts that you have about a particular group. And so really seeing your individual student as a student, as opposed to, oh, black students, oh, poor students act this way. So focusing on the individual. Perspective taking, so adopting the perspective of a marginalized group, and that helps you to better think about the impact that um, our policies and practices could have. And then finally, increased opportunities for contact that we form implicit biases based on our experiences when we have direct experiences with groups. But when we have limited experiences with groups, we are limited to what other people tell us or what we may experience in the media and not have anything to counter that. And so when we are in a fairly isolated bubble and are not interacting with individuals of different groups, we, don't, we have limited opportunities to challenge the biases that we hold. And so that's what, so this describes some strategies to combat that individual bias, which again, if you're in a position of power and authority, you definitely want to have a good sense of your, your own individual biases and work to reduce them so that it doesn't enact in how you practice as an educator or an administrator. But as I mentioned before, we have decision points that we don't always have to act right away. We're making a decision, do we send a student out of the classroom? Do we send them to the office, whatever have you? And these are called vulnerable decision points. And so they're defined as the contextual events or elements that increase the likelihood of implicit bias affecting discipline decision making. And so it looks at two parts. What are the actual elements of the situation itself? So what is the behavior? Who is a student? Where is this taking place? What is the time of day? But then also a person's internal decision state. Because when our own cognitive resources are low, because we are tired, because we are hungry, because we are irritated by something, we are going to respond more quickly. And that leads to biased responding. And so looking at vulnerable decision points from a review of close to 500,000 office discipline referrals for over 230,000 students by 50,000 plus educators in the country. And so looking at the pattern of office discipline referrals, they were able to identify these vulnerable decision points. And first is looking at that subjective problem behavior, that ambiguity. So defiance, disrespect, or disruption. Those are the most significant areas of discipline disproportionality. They also have to happen to be the categories that have the most subjectivity and ambiguity there. So teachers are making a decision. Is this a behavior infraction or not? Is this a major infraction, meaning that this student needs to be out of the school building or is it a minor one? And so again, when we think about ambiguous situations. Also, in non-classroom areas, there was more instances of discipline disproportionality. And so that may be due to lack of contact or lack of relationship between the adult and the student because you're just seeing them in passing. And so there was more disproportionality with regards to infractions that occurred in hallways or non-classroom settings overall. <laughs> 
And then when we're in the classrooms, we have to think about what are we asking of the students? So what are the task demands, um, the behavior that they displayed? Is it totally irrelevant? Is it keeping someone else from engaging in their instruct or their learning or instruction? Or is it just annoying to the particular teacher? So someone could be annoying without it being a discipline issue. And then they also saw differences with regards to time of day and that there were more discipline referrals in the afternoon. And so that leads to the teacher's decision state suggesting that they may be fatigued or they may be hungry and so have less cognitive resources available to engage in slow, deliberate thinking to mitigate the risk of bias responding. And so when we think about um, reducing implicit bias within these discipline referrals, we use neutralizing routines. And so in a typical situation, you have a setting event. You may not, you and the student just may not get along all that well and so have had few positive interactions. You could also be tired. The behavior itself happens. You're giving a worksheet. Okay, students, it's time to get to work. And then the student starts complaining and loud, like, oh, I don't want to do this. This task is boring. This is dumb. And they're just complaining. So you being frustrated, you're already tired. It's not the time of day for this. You already don't have a good relationship with the student. You're not having it. And so, okay, you're being disruptive. You're being disrespectful. I'm going to send you out of the office. And that's an office discipline referral. And the consequence is that the student leaves the classroom. They may get to escape an aversive task. Um, they may be interacting with other students that they like a detention. But what's also happening is that they're being removed from instruction. And so we know that has some other downstream consequences. And so... Implicit bias is enacting in multiple ways because we don't have a good relationship with the student. We're fatigued. And so we're not thinking through the situation as clearly as we could. And so more likely to respond in a knee jerk manner. And that's when bias responding is often prevalent, but we can interrupt it. And so when the student starts complaining about the work and you're like, okay, the student's being disrespectful you do this self check. Is this a vulnerable decision point? So you have a choice that you can make here. You can send the student out. You could also have the student stay. And so an alternative response is keeping the student in, see me after class. And so you're going to talk about it after class. But what happens is that it neutralized this chain. And so we didn't have the student being sent out of the office. We didn't have the student getting an in-school or out-of-school suspension, but we neutralize, we engage in this neutralizing routine to diffuse the situation and really help repair the relationship as well. And so, again, when we're thinking about reducing the effects of implicit bias within school discipline, we want to reduce the ambiguity in our office discipline referral definitions as well as within the behavior referral process. And so we want to have clear definitions of the problem behavior. What does it mean for a student to be disrespectful? What does it mean for a student to be defiant? What is the difference between a major infraction and a minor infraction? And along with that, clear guidelines for how staff and for staff versus teacher managed behaviors. Is this something that the student should be sent out for? Is this something that this teacher should be expected to handle within class? And so when I talk about reducing the ambiguity, by no means am I talking about having zero tolerance policies where there is this, if student does X, then automatically Y is what happens. But we're really working on developing clear operational definitions of the behavior, as well as clarifying the procedures to make sure that there isn't that level of subjectivity for implicit bias to emerge. We also want to think about our specific vulnerable decision points. And so in the previous slides, I highlighted vulnerable decision points based on national data. But this goes back to looking at your school data and thinking about what are the vulnerable decision points for your local school district, for your particular school. And then finally, teaching neutralizing routines, helping teachers understand when it may be a vulnerable decision point and how they could use alternate responses. And so a two-step neutralizing routine, when you see a problem behavior, stop and ask yourself, is this a vulnerable decision point based on the situation? So there's a lot of ambiguity. You don't know exactly what's happening. You didn't see everything occurring. 
or monitoring your own decision state. Am I in the right headspace to respond to this? Am I sending the student out because I'm irritated with the student or am I sending the student out because it actually is a disciplinary infraction that merits the student being sent to the office? And if it's a vulnerable decision point, using some agreed upon alternative and such as neutralizing routines. And so some good neutralizing routines, they're brief. So now this, then this. They're clear steps, they're doable, and they seek to interrupt the chain of events. And so that it's not this escalation and back and forth between the teacher and student, but it's really stopping things in their track to avoid having to send the student out of the classroom when it's not necessary to do so. And so other things for a good alternative response is delaying, so not responding right away, because it's in those snap decisions when we may see bias responding occur. And so by delaying to see you after class, that gives you a time to cool off. It also gives a student a time to cool off and really think through about what is the appropriate course of action for what occurred. That goes along with the pause. And so thinking it through first before automatically send the student out. By default, we want to use the least exclusionary choice because we don't want to deprive students of instruction. And then finally, we want to speak with students that we know the importance of positive relationships. Relationships matter. And so if students feel that there are adults within the school building and in the classroom that are supportive of them, that are looking out for them, that have their best interests at heart, and that assume the best of them, that could dramatically shape the relationship and how students behave. And so speak with the student to state your confidence in them and their capacity to do the things that you need them to do, as well as asking about any unmet needs. Because as I mentioned before, when we think about behavior, it's, ser it's serving some type of function. And so as educators, we want to understand well, what is the message that is behind that behavior and respond to that message as opposed to the behavior itself. And so again, if it's a vulnerable decision point, delay responses to the student behavior, speak privately to the student, take a few deep breaths. So thinking about your own mind state for it, as well as reframing the situation. And this is an example of a sample neutralizing routine. As, and here's an example of the restorative chat, which is also helpful to help foster the relationship between the student and the teacher. So tell, getting more about their sense of the side of the story as opposed to, again, making a decision based on limited information. So tell me what happened. What were you thinking? Who, what do you think about it now? Who was impacted? And helping them think through some reparative action as that helps them to learn um, about their behavior, as well as teaching the difference between appropriate and inappropriate behavior and those choices, as opposed to sending them out, which doesn't teach them anything. And so to sum it up, looking at this intervention approach to enhance equity within our discipline practices, we want to use engaging academic instruction to reduce the support gap, how much support students need in school, that achievement gap. We want to implement a behavior framework that's preventative, multi-tiered, as well as culturally responsive. We have to be mindful of the different groups that are within our school and solicit their input in the behavior process. We want to collect, use, and report disaggregated discipline data. And so I highlighted some disaggregated discipline data, but it was only disaggregated with regards to race. And while that is a helpful category to look at, it is somewhat limiting because I wasn't able to get information about socioeconomic status and looking at discipline or opportunity differences among those groups. I wasn't able to look at it with regards to gender, nor was I able to look at it at the intersection of any of those groups, because we have to think about the experiences of black male students versus black female students, white female students versus black female students. And so just not looking at these categories in absolutes, but taking a, a much closer look at our data to see what stories it tells. Because <clears throat> the issues of racial disproportionality are just one part of the story. We need to look at those race by gender interactions. We need to look at the race by socioeconomic status or at risk status interactions as well. 
we need to develop policies that have some type of accountability in them if we want to promote disciplinary equity. So that accountability piece is that we are collecting data, we're monitoring data, we're monitoring our progress, and when we look at the data, we're actually doing something about it. We're just not collecting it just for the sake of collecting it. And then finally, teaching neutralizing routines for these vulnerable decision points to reduce the likelihood of us sending students out of the classroom when it's not necessary to do so because that interrupts the student's learning. It also disrupts the relationship between the teacher and the student. Here are some resources here. And my contact information. And not sure if you still have time for questions. Dr. Malone, thank you. This, this is Christy, I'm back and, and wow. Um, I, I'm just amazed and we're so grateful for you giving us this path forward in tackling some difficult and um, challenging topics and, and helping us to identify a lens to look at not only our policies and practices, but to examine ourselves as individuals as well. And I, I do want to see if there are any questions and Austin, we might need your help. I don't know if um, we probably can't have folks actually speak because I don't think you have the capacity to unmute, but there would be an option either in the chat or through the Q&A tab. If there are questions, we would like to open that up. And I will send a slide so this could be posted on the website as well. Oh, wonderful. I think some things that really um, were, were really important when we look at making some of those database decision makings, um, database decision making process, um, I think the vulnerable, vulnerable decision point and really um, taking a look at our actions as adults is something that we've really been focused on as well here in Nebraska. Um, so we sure appreciate that message. We have a lot of thank yous and, and um, Lots of, of folks who really appreciate the information. Oh, so here is a question. In the early education area, so talking with some of our younger learners, it's difficult to say, see me after class. So thoughts on um, working out some of those relationship issues with some of our younger students mm -hmm. who can engage in that behavior? Sure. So my immediate thought is, helping them to disengage from the actual situation itself. And so thinking if there is a space in the classroom, such as a cool down corner, um, because it's especially, you can't reason. Well, it's hard, often hard to reason with young kids anyway, thinking about cognitive capacity, even more so when they're really upset about a situation. And so, especially for younger kids, behavior is definitely sending a message. And so it's important as adults not to internalize it because sometimes we make it about ourselves as opposed to the student, but it's really helping the student be able to calm down and helping them be in a quiet, more relaxed place so that they're able to get those strong feelings under control so that you can go through some type of restorative process. And it will look different for younger kids. Um, how can you hurt a friend? How can we make this better? Or when you interrupted the lesson, it wasn't helpful to your friends in the classroom. What is something that we could do to make this better? But it's really looking to diffuse attention, the immediate attentions of the situation because oftentimes when we're in, when we see these disciplinary infractions occur, regardless of age, it often becomes this power struggle between teachers and students. That the teacher is aggravated for being disrupted in some type of capacity and wants the student to be removed the students often digging in their heels, especially if they don't have a good relationship with the teacher, and then it becomes this power struggle, even though the infraction itself probably wasn't all that disruptive. And so when we think about the purpose of these neutralizing routines, it really is to diffuse those strong emotions to make sure that you as the adult in the room are in the mental headspace to make a good decision, that you're not doing this because you're annoyed, because you're frustrated, but you're really thinking about what is the best decision to make for the student and for the classroom. And then also to give the student the opportunity to disengage. And so for those younger kids, it will likely be some type of calming cool down as opposed to with an older kid asking them to wait until after class. Mm 
Awesome. Thank you. I'm keeping an eye out here. Other questions um, from the group? I know another important takeaway I hope that everyone really um, was able to attend to is thinking about those homogenous um, groupings. And if we have a group of like individuals that are creating policies and procedures, we need to be very aware of the potential for um, embedding some of the biases that we bring to the table. Um, I, I think that's important. We do have a lot of communities that do have some um, consistency in regard to the students and the population. So I felt like that was a really timely message as well that we can take away and pay attention to that. Thank you. And then I just had a question with regards to data uh, because I was looking at the state website because that is such an important and critical piece mm -hmm. Um, for schools to be able to take that closer look at their own data and be able to do the analyses themselves because the analyses that are often published by the district or um, if we're looking at federal data, it is really looking quite at it quite narrowly and not looking at those intersecting pieces, which are so important, especially I think about one of those comments earlier that they lack diversity. There's no such thing as a community that lacks diversity. There's always diversity that is present, but we have to be mindful about defining what that diversity looks like. And socioeconomic status came up a lot, even though as a state, it's in some of these districts, it's primarily white. That's gonna be the area of difference in looking at diversity embedded within your school. And so it's important to be able to look at that spectrum and the importance of being able to disaggregate your data and look at those intersecting identities as well. Again, a really great, great tool. And as we look at moving forward with the database decision making and some of the continuous improvement plans that we have in place, again, I think um, really important for us to, to consider and keep that in mind. Great. Well, I encourage people to feel free to contact me, email, um, my Twitter handle for any follow-up questions or comments. If you follow me on social media, I'm often posting or talking about different equity issues in pre-K through 12 education, as well as in higher ed and school psychology specifically. And we certainly, we appreciate your time together. And this is kind of a, a, the beginning of opportunities where we'll have you back in Nebraska in some different formats. I know NISPA, our state school psych organization has been reaching out to you and and um, we have some things in the work with the, with the service unit as well. So we are hoping to continue to get folks connected. And, and your message today is so um, important. And we appreciate you launching our school year and helping us to keep all of these pieces in mind as we move forward and, and work to meet the needs of all of our students. So we thank you and thank everyone who participated today. And we will hopefully see you all back Thursday afternoon, same time. And we will continue conversations. Right. And again, thank you so much for having me.